news of the kingdom of heaven. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. It's the greatest story ever told. Our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Like you've never seen it before. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name. The Chosen, airing on The CW, is a smash hit. They're shooting a scene, but they want us to hear what's happening. One of the top rated and most talked about shows on television right now. A lot of people have heard about it. Still, there are some people who've never heard about this story of Jesus Christ depicted in a way that is relatable and relevant. Has the money and the success of these other programs changed Hollywood's view. And tonight, News Nation brings you exclusive, rare access to the cast and crew of The Chosen. Any pressure? Do you think this is something that's unique to The Chosen? Are you changing the world? From the show's humble beginnings. I was not thinking anything You larger. weren't thinking of this as sowing a seed. You weren't, you were just being helpful. To its modern telling of the gospel. I think it's one of the first times, dare I say, this story is being told accurately. And whether Hollywood is finally ready to tell more stories of faith. Hollywood is great at providing entertainment, but I don't think it's the end all be all. Plus an exclusive look behind the scenes on the massive set in Texas. When we do go to the Last Supper, it actually didn't look like that painting. And the star's real world impact. Super excited to interview the actor that plays Jesus. He was invited to the Vatican twice to meet with the Pope. It all starts now in this News Nation special report The Chosen Phenomenon. Good evening. I'm Adrian Bankert, host of Morning in America on News Nation, and I'm really excited to share my exclusive conversations with the stars of The Chosen. Before the writer's strike, before the actor strikes began in Hollywood, I had the chance to visit the set and talk to the cast just outside of Dallas, Texas, all to bring fans and newcomers to the show closer to the worldwide phenomenon The Chosen has really become. We have a lot to get to this hour. We start with creator and director of The Chosen, Dallas Jenkins. You may know that name. Left Behind fans know his dad's popular book series and movies. And I talked to Dallas about how he's changing Hollywood and revolutionizing entertainment. Can you just introduce a little bit of who you are? Because, I mean, I might know, because I prepared for this conversation, that you're the son of one of the biggest authors in history. Your dad, you know, with his best-selling series, Left Behind. Just maybe just say a little bit about where you came from. Where did Dallas Jenkins come from? Yeah. Well, uh, I grew up in a, you know, strong evangelical home. Uh, as you mentioned, my dad, uh, uh, right around the same age as I was when The Chosen uh, exploded in popularity is when Left Behind uh, exploded in popularity and became one of the biggest uh, media brands in, in the faith space. So I got a, a, a good firsthand look, not only at storytelling, I, I inherited from my dad the desire to tell stories, um, but also uh, how he walked through the kind of attention that came from such an explosive, uh, not only explosive and a successful uh, project, but one specifically that's controversial, or one specifically that is about uh, the most famous book ever written. And so I got to see uh, how he responded. I got to see his humility, that he remained focused on the work regardless of the growth of it. So uh, coming into The Chosen, I didn't actually have any expectations. Uh, I I'd actually lost all of that uh, the year before The Chosen when I had a huge career failure. Uh, what do you mean? Well, I had a feature film that had finally achieved the goals that I'd set out for. My goals were success and attention, and I wanted to win awards. I wanted to show up at the box office. Like everybody in Hollywood. Yes, exactly. And I finally got my chance with a movie that was released nationwide with some of the biggest producers in Hollywood, and it completely failed. Just a total bomb. And I was left with, I went from being a director with a very bright future to a director with no future in just a couple of hours. And I got to a place where I genuinely surrendered, and I genuinely said, okay, God, I am willing to not make another movie if that's what you want. I don't care about the results anymore. I genuinely am willing to give that up. You had a come to Jesus meeting. I had a strong come to Jesus meeting. And, uh, and I think that's when God said, now you're ready for the chosen. And uh, so I went into it and I, well, not into the chosen, just briefly I'll share how I ended up doing a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service. And it was about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds. It was filmed on my friend's farm in Illinois, 20 minutes from my house. 
And it was then that I came up with the idea for the show. You were just being helpful. I, I was, yes. And, I, and, and it was a script that I'd put on the shelf, you know, a year before because of my big Hollywood opportunity. And uh, so when I, when I did the short film and came up with the idea for the show, I remember thinking, I'm in my wheelhouse more than ever. Even though I'm on a small farm in Illinois, uh, I feel like this is where I belong. Um, and then that short film is what went viral and led ultimately to crowdfunding season one of The Chosen. And now I've just been following from there. So where did the idea to crowdfund come from? Because you seem to tap into something, a momentum in crowdfunding that I don't know that has ever been done in entertainment. Yeah. I'd love to take credit for it, but I actually was skeptical. I didn't think it would work. It was an idea from the streaming platform that, that was interested in the show uh, years ago. And I said, uh, yeah, th th this, this won't work. Um, crowdfunding is typically what you see on social media when someone's trying to raise money on their birthday for some cause, and it never seemed, they never seem to get to their goal, and it's really small. The all-time crowdfunding record was $5.7 million from projects that had huge fan bases, and I had no fan base. And uh, that short film went out, and at the end of it I said, hey, um, you know, I'm, I got this idea for a show, and if you want to invest in it, you can. Um, I had, you know, because I didn't feel responsible for results anymore, I was like, all right, let's see what happens. What do I got to lose? That it exploded. To, went crazy, and now I'm talking to you on season four. Season four. So for you, what will change or what has changed after three very, very popular first three seasons? Yeah, here's what's interesting, and this is not just a platitude. Nothing has changed for me in the work. Uh, when I sit in front of the blank page with my co-writers to write a scene, the blank page doesn't care about the previous three seasons' success. When I'm on set with my cast, just like we were in season one, there's no difference when we're working between 100 people are going to watch this or 100 million people are going to watch this. The work is the same. We have to focus on making the best show that we can that's faithful to the character and intentions of Jesus and the Gospels. And so when I'm on set, I'm not thinking about how many people might watch it. I'm thinking about all right, we have to get through all of this in a day, and it has to be good. And so we, it's a very sacred space when we're working because that's the one place where all the voices outside of the show really aren't relevant. But I have a couple questions, and one I have to get to. In your bio that the company, the production company provided, it says, at the age of 25, shepherded this movie, Hometown Legend, to distribution with Warner Brothers. Then you just told about this movie idea that was about shepherds and the perspective. <laughs> Interesting. What is your creative process that may differ from others in the industry? Because shepherding seems to be something that surrounds you and follows you as you help others and bring them into the vision. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think that what's a little bit different in my case is that I'm not only a director on the set. Um, it, with The Chosen, I'm also the, the, the CEO of, of a company of 60 plus employees and I'm the boss of 150, you know, cast and crew uh, on set. And so the responsibilities are not just I'm making the show, but I'm also communicating with my audience. We've got an influencer model with this show. So I'm shepherding the cast and crew, I'm shepherding uh, my company, and I'm also shepherding the audience in many ways uh, because I'm communicating with them nearly every single day about the process. I'm letting them in. It's very important that they trust uh, me because I have been tasked with portraying the most important person in history and to a lot of our viewers it's extremely important and extremely vital and I want to get that right. Uh, ultimately I follow uh, a shepherd that uh, that I uh, uh, um, surrender to and am, am humble before and so hopefully I'm doing uh, uh, as good of a job following that shepherd as hopefully the people who are uh, following me. What's the definition of shepherding? Uh, in a well, sentence. Yeah, I, well, I, I wish I could give it in one sentence. Um, but uh, w one of the best things that I've heard was in Psalm 23. It talks about how, uh, it talks about shepherding sheep. And uh, a shepherd is vigilant. And so I think that my job is to be vigilant for those I'm responsible uh, for. And in this case, primarily more than anything else, it's my cast and crew and my company. And then uh, after that, it's hopefully the viewer's shepherding them towards uh, a story that I want to tell. In terms of Jesus, I mean, he's still a controversy. You know, anytime you bring up the name Jesus, it's going to create and elicit these different responses. Are you making Jesus cool? <laughs> I'm not making Jesus anything. Jesus is who he is. I'm just happening to tell a story about him and trying to portray it as accurately and authentically as I can. People's response to it is not up to me. Last question. In terms of this being a faith series versus a historical depiction, 
Where do you define The Chosen? I let the viewer define that. Uh, we know that the show has been uh, loved and appreciated by people of all faiths or, or not. Our cast and crew, the majority of them come from not only different faith backgrounds, but a lot of them come from no faith backgrounds. Uh, I consider the show more of historical drama, uh, but my own, of course, it's in, imbued with my own personal faith. I believe Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the universe, and I don't shy away from showing that. But uh, in the context of the show, I'm just trying to accurately portray his life and let the viewers decide how they want to respond. Next. That was the thing that I hadn't done. I hadn't surrendered. I hadn't given it up. And you and Dallas used that word. Do you believe that you two were divinely connected? Yeah. I think this is part of God's plan for sure. Jesus, the actor portraying him, that is, on whether his work in The Chosen is having a real world impact. Are you changing the world? And his conversation with the Pope when this News Nation special report returns. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I'm preparing something to share with the world. These things will make sense to some, but not to others. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In this world, bones will still break, hearts will still break, but in the end, the light will overcome darkness. I'm here to start a revolution. I want to know when you knew you were meant to be called to be an actor. An actor? Oh. Um, I think when I, when I booked the first thing I ever auditioned for, I thought, oh, maybe there's something here. Uh, and that was, uh, that was like when I was 23, but I, I, I didn't really think about the long-term implications. I just thought, well, I didn't expect to get that job and maybe God had something in mind for me as a performer. Did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were a kid or when you were in like high school? I wanted to, uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> well, those are two different answers. Um, as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. As in high school, I know I wanted to be in film. I thought I was going to go into special effects. I went to an art school. I studied film. And then, uh, and then I realized, because I went to art school in New York, we didn't quite have the programs that they have in California for special effects training. So I thought, once I went to film school, I thought, you know what, maybe I'll be a director. And then I, I, uh, I had taken some acting classes as prerequisites to, you know, because we had to. And then I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should give acting a shot just to know what an actor goes through to be a better director so I can direct them better. And then I ended up auditioning for this one job for MTV and I booked it. I'm like, wait a second, what does that mean? So there were signs that you were in your wheelhouse and then yeah. you end up auditioning for the role of Jesus. Many, 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 many years later, yes. <clears throat> and obviously, you know, it's been a journey. But how much has Jonathan Rumi's life changed? You are already very much a faithful man. Faith has always been important to you from what I've read. But now that you've really, you have the role of a lifetime, how is it different from, say, a decade ago? Uh, I mean, it's, it's indescribably different. It's unquantifiably different. It's, uh, it's, it's heads and tails different. Um, you know, 10 years ago, Ten years ago, I was just getting started in L.A., really. I was just a couple of years in L.A., three years in L.A. And you have an idea of how you think your career is going to go, what steps to follow, and then you have reality. And uh, very often, the two don't quite, you know, um, line up. They don't up. jive. Yeah, yeah they, don't really, they don't really sync up. And, uh, and so I got to a point where I was basically desperate and uh, out of money and out of food and, and I just realized in that moment that I had no other alternative but to completely and wholly rely on my faith and um, to just offer everything up in prayer, to surrender my notions, my concept of what it meant to, to have a career, to, to be successful, to 
to survive and offer that up to God and just say, God, you show me what, where you want me to go and what you want me to do because at this point, I'm out of options and I'm giving it to you. And he did. He did that very day that I actually had that made that prayer and changed my life in an instant, in a matter of hours, from the time I had this prayer to the time I, I came back to my apartment. I left my house, come back, and all of a sudden I experienced this incredible financial windfall that came out of nowhere and made me realize that, okay, that's that was the thing that I hadn't done. I hadn't surrendered. I hadn't given it up. And you and Dallas used that word. Do you believe that you two were divinely connected? Yeah, I think this is part of God's plan for sure. When you meet people who know you play Jesus, do you think that you have some sense of responsibility to portray him? I mean, from the Gospels, the book of Matthew, you know, learn from me, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lonely of heart. This show is all about a different depiction of Jesus than maybe the world has ever seen. Do you feel responsible for making sure that that real image of Jesus is known? I feel responsible to show up and give everything that I have to this role. And then what God does with it is up to him. You will proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do you think you've been able to so successfully be in this role? I mean, people have remarked at how much you have brought your heart, brought your faith, and brought this sense of peace. I mean, watching you on camera, there's no denying that it's, it's special. Grace. Just God's grace, it's, that's, that's how I'm able to be here. In terms of people who maybe are not of faith, but they have heard about the show, how would you describe the show to them? They've never walked in a church. The show is a, uh, a very well-told historical drama about the life of Jesus and his disciples. And he is a man who changed the world, whether or not you believe he was the son of God or is God, uh, he changed the world, uh, you know, uh, forever. And, uh, and so I think there's a character that anyone who watches the show, there's at least one character that anybody who watches the show will be able to identify with. And nine out of 10 people can't get through an episode without weeping or connecting or being reminded of some part of their own life that they see played out, but brought into the light and uplifted. And, uh, and I think what we, what we do, what we make with the show is, uh, <clears throat> is such a relief compared to all the darkness that's in media right now. All this, a lot of the storytelling that we see in um, most major networks and streaming networks, there's just so much darkness and heaviness to have. Uh, a show that kind of brings a ray of light and gives people hope, uh, gives people something to believe in that is bigger than themselves, I think, I think is, a, is a great service to, to culture and to the world. Are you changing the world? God's changing the world through the project that I'm working on. Ah, this special conversation with actor Jonathan Rumi, who has met twice with the Pope. His reaction to that here. Because I'm playing Jesus, I think. Yeah, and, and because I love the Pope. Um, and this was a, a huge honor to be able to, uh, to be here. Rumi truly embodies the sanctity of this role, and he's very candid about his own faith, something that can be pretty rare in Hollywood, even as shows and movies centered around a belief in God have surged in popularity. I talked about that part of the story with former DreamWorks executive Mark Surian, who is now the production president of The Chosen. So many of the cast members are telling me that either they were just coming out of or in the midst of one of the worst times of their life, right, right before they did the show. Right. I don't think that's a coincidence. What do you think about this show in particular, this project, actually bringing light not only to audiences, but to the people who work on it? Well, I think it's hard to divorce the subject matter from how it affects the people who are involved yeah. in the show. Um, and I think that starts with Dallas Jenkins, the filmmaker. It, it, he 
what makes him a great filmmaker and I think what makes the show so great is that it's personal and that it comes from a very personal place. And um, it's hard to do a show or a series about Jesus and not take in some of the lessons and some of the things that Jesus espouses internally. And so it's not surprising that these actors who are playing these parts in particular are feeling some sense of transformation from the roles that they're playing. And for myself, I'll say, you know, I believe strongly in entertainment. I think that entertainment is important in people's lives. I've been doing this for over 20 years, but I will say that I think there's something extra special about The Chosen. I see how people react to it. I, I see the comments. I see how fans say that it's given them a sense of purpose or a guiding light. And that's an extra special um, response to the show. And you can't help but feel... Uh, the benefit of that and a sense of responsibility that comes with it. You've worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. You work with DreamWorks and Spielberg. Sure. Do you believe that the next innovation in entertainment is to have more of that special, to have more of that experiential transformation, or do you think this is something that's unique to The Chosen because it is a Bible story? You know, I'm not sure. I will say this. I think what's making The Chosen catch on in a very significant way is that Hollywood is great at providing entertainment, but I don't think it's the end-all be-all. I think there's clearly a, a, a hole in the marketplace that Hollywood has not been able to fulfill, um, and that The Chosen, which is off the beaten track, has found uh, a way to um, provide something for audiences that Hollywood has yet to do. Coming up next, rare access inside the set of The Chosen. News Nation takes you to Dallas, Texas. I don't know if there are any parts of the community that replicated the old days. Dallas did um, and brought back tons of photos. Um, that sort of led us down a rabbit hole of, of research. Plus, hear from the stars who play Mary Magdalene and Matthew on the importance of the women in Jesus' life and the choice to portray one of the 12 disciples as a person with autism. And the character was presented so interesting to me uh, for being on the spectrum and just having that kind of fit into what we what we know about him in, in the Gospels and just being detail oriented was was kind of cool. And I just want to play with that. So we're in one of the most ornate spaces on this lot. I mean, you can tell all the commotion behind me because this is one of the few places on the set that's air conditioned. So everybody's chilling. But interestingly enough, every piece of this set is made out of styrofoam covered in stucco. It looks so real. Yeah, every one of those stones is just a one inch piece of styrofoam. Um, it was it's so funny seeing it before the senior artist came in and covered it in paint. There was just white balls flying everywhere as they carved. Um, they have a really cool um, process they do to make styrofoam look like stone. They'll lay it flat and dribble acetone on it. This is a, this is a one of a kind um, soundstage. It's a 37,000 square foot building, um, 10,000 square feet of production offices and uh, um, uh, bullpens. And my uh, art department office is over here where the people who dream up these amazing sets work. But it's, it's a fascinating process to watch just unfold that fast. Yeah, I mean, within a couple of hours, a set is, is in its larval stages, but it's, there's something there. Oh, what is this? This is the you gotta sh you gotta show me again. <laughs> I was like, where are we? To season uh, to episode no season six, when we do go to the Last Supper, it actually didn't look like that painting. They were actually sitting around a three-sided table, having their dinner. So this is sort of planting that seed, and teaching the audience the vocabulary of what it was really like back then. It, I don't know if there are any parts of the community that replicated the old days. Dallas did um, and brought back tons of photos um, that sort of led us down a rabbit hole of, of research. But none of us have had the time. And once we yeah. started with the show, it's been almost nonstop. How long did it take to build this home? Um, the entire complex was done in nine months. Yeah. There I mean, was an, the, the there, whole thing, everything. The back lot as well. The um, there was an army 
of, and I tell you, an army of workers putting this together. All and that's day. while you're shooting. Yeah, before you know, before we even put a hammer to the nail, there's all there's all the research and the and the design work, um, and then uh, then we start building, and then by the time we get the first couple of sets up, then the cast is moving in, and they're st they start to shoot. Normally was the, the progress. Now we were able to, with 12 weeks of prep, get everything put together, and then go Dallas. Here's your playground. Go go to town. It's like a little walk, man. We have to be quiet because they're shooting a scene, but they want us to hear what's happening, and they're playing the scene for us on these screens. And I'm still being too loud. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. This is different. Get used to different. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. You do Bollywood dancing? Yeah, former, but you know, might bring it back. Like, could you, do you have like any seat? You know how all the dances now, which is all moving your hands, it's like TikTok? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Bollywood I mean, the typical like... one is like the light bulb. The and light then you just bulb? like pump your shoulders up. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Am and so, yeah, yeah, you're doing a great <laughs> job. Maybe just like arc, oh. yeah, there you go. And yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's I, all energy. I just wanted a Bollywood. I just wanted to try it. I'll teach you. I'll teach you something after that. You gotta use your leg. It would be fun. Yeah. What made you think? You know, I, I mean, obviously, you get called in for a part. But what made you think that you could play one of the most integral roles in the most well-known, most circulated book in history? You know what's funny? I what? didn't think. I just, I just believed in myself. I believed in the fact that I could do justice to this role. Mm -hmm. And the character was presented so interesting to me yeah. uh, for being on the spectrum and just having that kind of fit into what we what we know about him in, in the Gospels and just being detail oriented was, was kind of cool. And I just wanted to play with that. I'd actually auditioned for a show where the main character was also autistic oh. earlier. So I kind of, I make notes on characters that yeah. are interesting to me. And so I remember it because it's a lot of research. So kind of use that. And then with Dallas's uh, collaboration and it, it's just kind of, we just kind of hit the, the money, I guess, or like the secret. Yeah, the sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, because I, I was, I, I've watched the first season. It's an entirety, and I just, it was very easy to watch, mm -hmm. and I just thought, wow, I was like. I bet you there's a lot of people watching the show who can relate to your part, who just feel like outsiders, who feel like they don't fit in with their people, yeah. and they don't fit in with anybody else, and who are they going to belong to? Where's their tribe? Until being called on by this great leader. Mm -hmm. So do you have people actually tell you that? Do you get feedback from viewers? All the time. And you know, I, I love that because it, it not only encourages me, but it makes me want to go deeper and, and grow with the character, you know? So just trying to keep him uh, more layered and, and more um, uh, just showing the acceptance that, that he presents and having people relate to him is, is what's important. I think that's why the show is doing so well because people can identify with Mary, Matthew, all the rest of the it's disciples. Really human people. Yeah, yeah, we're just so humanized and it's, it's a gift. I, I, just, I just don't know how to explain it. It just feels so good to ha get a response like that globally. Globally. Yeah. I mean, really world renowned. I thought it was fascinating that Dallas and the team decided to really tell the story of a woman. Right out the gate. I mean, was that important to you, Liz? Oh, yeah. I, I, I remember seeing the audition and seeing that it was based on the Gospels. And I was like, oh, please, like, don't be cheesy and don't be, like, um, so focused on that. Like, I was really thrilled when I saw how in-depth her character was. And she has a very realistic background and history and something that I was relating to and I know a lot of other women have related to. So it was it's a relief to see. Um, just, just some some screen time of of a realistic storyline for a woman. What? How did you relate to the part? I, uh, when I booked it, I was uh, in a state of dis depression, <laughs> and um, I sort of didn't know what to do with my life. And I was broke. I was living with my mom. I was trying to quit acting because it wasn't working, and because um, I wasn't working, <laughs> and mm. uh, I was, I was depressed and um, and so when I read the the scenes for the the sadder parts of Mary I just I was like this is me right now and this is what I need to right now um, and to see what happens to her at the end of that first episode I'm like that's what I need <laughs> and so it was it was just sort of like an interesting sync up of um, just to, as a gift
Did it bring you out of your depression? Did the part just playing this? Because, you know, Mary, we can say it, yeah. famously was demon possessed and a prostitute. Yeah. And you portray this possession, but today we would call it mental illness yeah. um, or depression or, or yeah. yeah, or all kinds of trauma. Did playing this part and her deliverance bring you your own? Um, that's a beautiful question. I think that um, I think the way de what deliverance looks like to me is something a little more complex and uh, takes time. I think depression itself is something that I think people are, may have to struggle with their entire lives, but to find light and to find hope and love and a community of really loving people helps with that. It helps remind you that there's so much good in the world. There's so much love in the world. And when you're stuck in this depression and you don't have that, it's just dark. But but that's, I mean, the show is showing where to find the light, how to create love and joy in this world. And so over the course of these years, yes, it, I have, I've been, um, changed by the experience of playing this and just by in being influenced by it. How has your life changed? I mean, paint a picture. You showed me what it was like before you got the part. Sure. Now you're known all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for, uh, in terms of the internal change, I've opened up my heart and, and um, been open to accepting love. <laughs> um, I got married to a wonderful man. I Thank you. <laughs> I uh, have like a whole group of amazing friends that just shower me with love constantly. Um, a lot of it is accepting it. A lot of it is not turning it away. And so I think that internal change has just like a snowball effect has just created so many wonderful experiences and opportunities and um, and and because of that, you know, you, you start making different decisions and healthier decisions and um, and life can change. It takes a little bit of time, but it, I think it's love that changes us. Next. I think when people hear a show about Jesus, they automatically think that it's going to be terrible, <laughs> that it's going to be cheesy, um, because they sort of have for many, many years. How The Chosen succeeds where other TV adaptations of the Bible have failed. Plus... My son, they've run out of wine. The responsibility of playing the most famous mother in history. Any pressure? None whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph handed him to me. It was like nothing I expected. It was like everything I'd heard about having a baby, but I thought this would be completely different. He was cold, and he was crying, and he needed my help. This story, this show, you're playing the Virgin Mary. I mean, you're playing the mother. Any pressure? None whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I, I like to, I like to say that I don't. I try not to think about it until I'm doing press, and then all of a sudden I, it then you realize, like, oh yeah, right. It's it's her. What I do is I try to focus on what's on the page. I love the take that our writers have on her focusing on the relationship her relationship with um, with her son on um, seeing her um, you know uh, with a friend uh, talking making jokes um, you know I feel like we see her in such a new light now um, as a woman not only as a mother um, which you know is at her core and and of course she's the most famous mother but she's also a woman she was also in living through these crazy times and um, I like that we can that we can see a little bit more of her life. Do you think that people confuse or misunderstand what the show is about? I think so. A thousand percent. I so I think when people hear a show about Jesus they automatically think that it's gonna be terrible <laughs> that it's gonna be cheesy um, because they sort of have for many, many years um, until you actually 
watch it and you see how incredible it's truly made. The writing, the, um, the humanity that comes out, we're so much more alike than we're different. And I feel like it's a show for everyone. You know, it's not just for people of, of faith. I mean, other, I, we get messages from people that are literally, he said, I'm an atheist, but this show cinematography is too good to pass up. I mean, that's mind blowing. So, so what do you hope happens as a result of you choosing The Chosen? This show really has a message of hope. Mm -hmm. And I think people are responding to it. I think people are in need um, of shows of content that really uplifts and is heartwarming and, and hopeful. Up next, how does The Chosen compare with biblical truth? And why is the show resonating with so many, so widely of many faiths, even atheists, right now? My exclusive conversation with Pastor Rick Warren, founder of Saddleback Church and author of the wildly popular New York Times bestselling book, The Purpose Driven Life. His renewed push to complete what he says is every Christian's responsibility ahead of the 2000th anniversary of the Great Commission. Welcome back to this News Nation special report, The Chosen Phenomenon. I'm Adrian Bankert, host of Morning in America, right here on News Nation. Shows like The Chosen are part of a rise in entertainment focused around stories from the Bible and stories from faith. Major movie studios, big name directors, they've launched projects targeting audiences that are interested in faith stories. I want to bring in one of the most well known pastors on the planet who has made it his mission uh, to spread the word of God and also has been a big part of messaging that has left the four walls of the church and made it all the way around the globe. Pastor Rick Warren founded Saddleback Church back in the 80s with his wife. Uh, there is a weekly attendance at his 16 locations of 30,000 people. And you've likely heard of his best-selling book too, The Purpose Driven Life. It's sold more than 50 million copies since its release in 2002. He's going to talk with us right now and, and tell us about why he thinks projects like these are so important to the conversation. I think the secret behind the success of um, the, the Chosen is it's showing Jesus as he really was. There's so many fake, phony ideas uh, of stained glass Jesus or hippie Jesus or uh, angry Jesus. or all. The bottom line is, Jesus was the most attractive person who ever lived. He attracted enormous crowds wherever he went. And even today, 2.6 billion people would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. So many in Hollywood have shunned stories of faith and, and so many projects uh, by faith-based uh, studios have been frankly pretty cheesy. Uh, even the cast of The Chosen expressed to me how grateful they were that this project was done with excellence, that it looked like a major production. Well, I've had the opportunity to be involved in consulting on other uh, movies of faith when Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg and uh, David Geffen's formed DreamWorks. The very first movie they decided to tell was Prince of Egypt, which is the story of Moses. Mm -hmm. I actually consulted on that. Uh, it was a big, huge success for DreamWorks. Of course, I helped Mel Gibson when they did The Passion. I helped Mark Burnett and Roman Downey when they did Son of God, A.D. And, and, and things that are well made uh, are, are going to get a hearing. But you yourself are working on a project that is revolutionary. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing to spread the gospel? We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross in A.D. 33. And Christians, we believe that he rose again in A.D. 33. He gave what is called the Great Commission to his followers and say, go spread the good news. It's the 2000th anniversary of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christians all around the world, I'm talking about Catholics, Pentecostals, Protestants, Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, interdenominational, every, every kind. Of, they're going to be celebrating many, many groups, about 2000 denominations, um, and major agencies and church networks have come together in what's called finishing the task. And they actually chose me to lead it for the next 10 years. Uh, this Easter, starting on Easter Sunday, 2024, maybe a quarter of a million churches around the world are going to start the first of nine campaigns uh, to start what's called finishing the task. What would you say is the time we are in right now culturally? 
where you are working with this great campaign, where a show like The Chosen is being seen by millions and millions of people around the world, translated into dozens of languages. Is there a new hunger for belief in God today? Oh, oh absolutely, Adrian. You know, if you study uh, history, uh, bad times in the world are actually good times for spiritual growth because when, pe when things are going good, people ignore God. We forget God. We, we get self-satisfied. Um, there's so many things that are happening that are negative uh, in, our, in our world. Still ahead, water into wine, the new character helping tell the story of Jesus's first miracle. And may I present the finest, most beautiful vintner in all of Galilee? Rabbi, I have a concern. You said you're sending us out two by two. You will follow in my footsteps, and you will know what it actually means to give up your life. How important was it for you guys to work on a show that had so much diversity? I mean, this is one of the most diverse casts I think I've ever seen. Really? That's cool. That was pretty cool. Let's get it. Nice, we did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's awesome. You know what I mean? It's, uh, this is a show that is very inclusive and, and brings all walks of life, and I think it's one of the first times, dare I say, this story is being told accurately, you know what I mean? And uh, I love that Dallas, Tyler Ryan, all of them took that stuff into consideration. So. When, when you say uh, accurately, what do you, when you, I saw that little smirk. <laughs> what are you alluding to, Joey? And these people are from all different walks of life, you know, each character comes from different regions. So it makes sense that it would be different kinds of people in the show. Well, you have one of the most important scenes. I mean, turning water into wine, the first miracle that Jesus does. You own, I guess it's you are the vintners, and it's Rama and Thomas. I think a lot of us feel lucky that we're, we're doing this. There were so many interviews, we didn't have time to share them all tonight, but you can watch all of my conversations with every cast member right now by going to newsnationnow.com. And be sure to check out Morning in America with me and Marky Martin every weekday morning right here on News Nation. And of course, The Chosen airs Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern on our sister network, The CW. From our headquarters, I'm Adrian Bankert. Have a great night. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.